Um, <laughs> we've been talking about identity and, and even, you know, the worship music we were playing today, identity, identity, identity. Identity is wrapped up in, in the truth of God. That's what it is. It's who am I? What am I created for? Right? That's what we've been talking about. Who am I? What am I created for? We've gone over a couple things the last few weeks. We've gone talking about being in Christ. And if you're not Christian today, if you don't know Jesus, we're so glad you're here. Safely journey and search. We pray that God speaks to you. Um, and if you know Jesus here today, then the hope would be that, again, something shifts in your spirit to take you a little bit deeper into the revelation of who you are because of who God is. Um, so we talked about being in Christ and how we get put into Christ. And then the last time I preached two weeks ago before Mother's Day, I talked about letting. And would say let. 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 And the simplicity of the gospel is now primarily actually shown through letting. It's letting God do the things that he is able to do. And when you don't let, then he can't. Not because he's not powerful, but because we get to make a choice. And today I want to talk to you about uh, what I think God's shown me in just a third core foundational piece of this identity that we're now given, and it's just about remaining. See, it's going to sound somewhat like let, but I want, to, I want to go to John 15 with you guys. The verses don't need to be up on the screen just yet, but if you have your Bibles, open up to John 15. Uh, everyone say, this is the truth. I would challenge you to get, grab your Bible and carry it with you everywhere you go. Uh, this thing here is living and active and full of the eternal breath of God. I think it was uh, the John who was talking about that a little bit ago. Breath that. Oh. Listen, this thing isn't like words on a page. I've read great novels before. I like J.R.R. Tolkien, and um, I haven't really read C.S. Lewis. Yes, I am Christian, though. But J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, those stories move me. They're awesome. They're written so powerfully, and it can jump into this thing. Listen, what if that story was alive? And every time you opened it, you realize this is real. This is the truth. That's what Scripture is. 66 books full of truth, breathing at you. God saying, I got something for you. This is really good. So a um, couple quick things. Mickey and I, my wife and I, we like to watch some movies Two movies that we've watched recently, uh, I'm not necessarily giving a stamp of approval. I'm just letting you know that we watched them, okay? Can I be transparent? Okay. One of them was Passengers. Uh, Passengers is, is a movie, right? Yeah. I thought it was a good movie. Um, so the, the idea behind Passengers is th this man and woman primarily ends up being about them. But it's this group of people. They're put on this spaceship. I love sci-fi. My wife is too. That's right. We're nerds. It's Okay. It's a sci-fi movie. They're on this, this spaceship, like a giant shuttle, if you will. And people, 5,000 or so people, are being transported from Earth to another planet to set up a new colony. Okay? Now, on this, on this ship, I'll call it a spaceship. But it sounds, that makes it sound fake. It's real, though. <laughs> it's, I don't know why. Anyway. So 5,000 people in this thing. And the way they travel there is, is, is really interesting because the, the trip itself is going to take 120 years to get from Earth to the new planet, all right? So what they do to ensure that there are people living by the time they get there, 120 years, we don't live that long, they create these pods, habitation pods. And in these pods, the people are pretty much in this cryogenic state. They are receiving oxygen and whatever else they need. Um, and as long as they remain in the pod, they'll make it to the new colony. Simple as that. Unfortunately, something happens. I don't want to give you the whole plot because then someone's going to get mad at me. But bottom line is something happens. I'll give you this much. The, the guy, he ends up getting released from his pod early. And uh, it leads to a lot of problems, a lot of challenges. And there's a, there's a neat story kind of that, that happens from it. But, but it's a great challenge now because he realizes that the pod released him 90 years early. He's already, let's say, 30 or 40 years old. It's, you know, so 90 years, he, again, he's, gonna, he's not going to make it. Uh, he's going to die. So he's got to figure out what to do now. But had he remained in the pot, he would have been fine. There's another movie we watched recently. This one I will give a stamp of approval on. 
Not with that noise, no. Lion. <laughs> Lion. Has anyone seen Lion? It's a really good movie, and it's based on a true story. This is a story about a boy in India who was kind of running around with his family one day. It's his whole life story, what happens with him. But it starts with this little boy going to a train station in India with his older brother. And the boy, the younger one, is told by his older brother, stay right there. Don't move. I'm going to be right back. And, of course, the older brother takes off and goes, takes care of whatever business he needed to. But the little boy, who was told to stay, remain there, ends up, he was kind of napping. So his brother was like, okay, I'll just let you be there and sleep. Well, the little brother wakes up, and he doesn't know what time has gone by. He's a little kid. So he looks around, and his brother's not around. The train station is quiet. He gets up, and he starts searching. He leaves where he was at, and he ends up going into, walking into a train that was parked there, gets on this train, and his whole entire life and his family's life is radically transformed from that moment on. But had he remained, it would have been fine. See, staying in one place isn't easy for us, is it? Right? <laughs> Dave's got some stories. We'll ask you later, Lucy. In remaining in a place or by not moving, wow, I want to hear that later. <laughs> Here are some things that happen, such as maybe the little boy in Lion. He wakes up, and all of a sudden he thinks, oh my gosh, I've missed something. Some, something's happened to me. If I stay here now, my brother isn't here, though his brother said stay. Something's happened. There are no more people. Something's happening. I must have missed out. I need to f- go and figure this out. And it ends up being you know, God's gracious, but a transformational decision without giving you the details. A lot of times we feel like we need to be doing something, and, and there's a tension in this message, and I'm, I'll point to that as we go on. But we find that by not remaining in one place sometimes, by, by actually moving from a place we currently are, we find ourselves doing things that are not necessarily, or in situations that are not necessarily the most life-giving. And we wonder, how did I get here? We're part of a go, 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 do more culture that rejects often the notion of doing less and getting more, which I touched on two weeks ago when I was talking about letting, letting light shine. But what if you could be assured that in learning this one principle of Jesus called remain, I would say remain, you would find deeper truths of your identity. That's what I want to go into today. If you have your Bible, you can open up John 15. Verses will be up here. I want to give you some background to this text. What's happening here, Jesus has been teaching for a few years. He's been with his disciples, hanging out, doing all these amazing things. He's been teaching the kingdom of God. He's been demonstrating. Everyone say demonstrating, right? Because with Jesus, Jesus is the fullness of God, right? Human form, theanthropic is a term that's really cool. It's created just for Jesus. He's the only one who has that term in all of history. He's theanthropic. He is demonstrating the full kingdom of God, teaching it, preaching it, living it, signs, wonders, and miracles, healing and praying for people. And you would think that after all of this, right, the disciples would have this picture of who Jesus is and what he's pointing to and where he's taking them. But a lot of us would know that that's not necessarily the case. After three years, these guys uh, who, are, who are still, they're just still struggling with who Jesus is. And, and it, it's kind of highlighted in this, getting, I'm moving up to chapter 15 in a moment. But in chapter 14, verse 5, after being with these guys for so long, Thomas says to Jesus, he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Because he had just said to them, listen, I'm the way, I'm the truth, the life. And Thomas is like, dude, I got a good question for you, Jesus. We don't know where you're going. So how can we know how to get there? He's probably looking at his buddies. like, That's a great question. And this is what Jesus says. He's like, he says it, I am the way and the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, that's kind of, if you really knew me, Thomas, you would know my Father as well. From now on, though, listen, you do know him and you have seen him. What? Philip, another guy, he's been with Jesus for a long time. This is the context to chapter 15. Philip says this, I got a great question. This is me inserting that. 
uh, or calling it, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. We're done. We're good. And then here's what Jesus says. Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time. Three years. Lots of time. Lots of awesome testimonies. All this teaching, and we don't even have a margin of how much Jesus taught them and the encounters, the experiences that they had. Scripture says that if we, if we had all of those records, it would fill up the, the annals of history in the libraries of the world. So this is the context of John 15. These are guys not necessarily primed for understanding, though we would think, we would think so. And so this is what Jesus then moves into as he's explaining things to these disciples. In John chapter 15, it'll be up on the screen. Verses 1 through 8. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. Everyone say, remain. As I also remain in you. Say, remain. All right, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. It's two words, in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And he wraps it up with this awesome promise. The next one. Do we have it? It might have shown the first part. It, it finishes like this. This is my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's pretty awesome. Other translations would say this, that word remain would be trans, translated abide, abide, remain, depending on where you're, you're coming from. Jesus is saying this to disciples. Think about it, though. He's had all this time. And, and in this text, he's continuing to say, listen, remain with me, which is better. Remain with me, remain in me. Remain in me. They've been with him, but he's saying remain in me. There's a lot to that, but we may not go there today. Jesus is saying this. He's handling something that he knows these disciples who have spent all this time are going to face. Saying, it's going to feel strange. Listen, guys, it's going to feel strange not being with me anymore. It's going to be weird. Because like, you think I'm really amazing, and I am. But I have something even better planned. But I, I, but I already have the understanding from my Father in heaven that the feeling of me removing myself presently is going to be so awkward and uncomfortable for you. I want to make sure you get something really, really clear. You don't need to do more. You need to stay in me. Just stay in me. He's saying, being that you've had such a hard time, guys, understanding pretty much everything I've ever said to you, is that... Speak to any of us. God's truth is hard sometimes. Like there's no way it's that simple or there's no way, God, that can be possible. But everything he says I've taught you up until now, I just want to be, I just want to be clear on one thing. Just stay. Just stay in me. When circumstances around us change, guys, there's going to be persecution that's coming your way. Peter, there's going to be a lot that comes your way. Judas, there's going, to be, there's going to be a lot of angry people. They're not going to understand what I was about, and they're going to persecute you because of it. I want you to remember this one thing. Remain in me, and I'll remain in you. You're like, and? That's... That's easy, Jesus. That's simple. He's like, just stay. 
We find ourselves sometimes feeling the need to compensate when circumstances around us change. You understand? Sometimes we see something outside of us shifting or moving relational situations, work situations. This is real life. Everything and anything. There's transition in our lives all the time. Are you aware of that? Is it just me? Okay. And for me, every two years, it seems to be very significant transition. Significance, that would be a cool word. Um, but really significant transition, really big things. And in my mind, at times, my mind starts thinking, oh, God, this is too big, this is too heavy, this is too much. And I feel like that's part of what Jesus is talking about. He's saying there will be big things, and then there's going to be everyday opportunities for you to do something other than just believe that staying present in me, letting my love run through you, is going to be enough. But it's enough. I would say that's good news. Jesus says this with those changing circumstances. He says, no, 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 no. I'm all that you need, and I just really, really want to make sure that you get this. Going through this text, Jesus states a very, very critical statement in verse 4. We're going to go through this. If you have your Bibles. He says this, remain in me, I'll remain in you. The first slide is this. It says, basically, I'm not moving, so stay here. Right? He says, I'm not moving, so stay here. It'll be up there in five, four, three, two, one. He's got it back there somewhere. Sometimes language can help, can help us, but John 4, remain in me and I'll remain in you. He's saying, listen, I'm not going to go anywhere. But imagine how crazy that was to the disciples when at the same time he's telling them that he's leaving. Come on, are you guys tracking with this? He's telling them prior to this, he's starting to tell them that, listen, I'm going to be going away. And they're like, no, Jesus, you can't go away. And, and at the same time, he's just saying, remain in me. There's a tension with his statement. Why? Well, this is, this is pointing to the power of God in the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Each one of them is unique in their own right, but uniquely wound and bound together. They cannot be separated. So he's saying, if you would just stay present with me, you're going to have everything that you need. I'm not moving, so stay here. In this text, in just these few verses, remain. Jesus says this word remain eight times. Eight times. When it comes to scripture, you guys, one of the simplest things that we can do is just make, make snapshot observations. Do you have that slide up there? I don't know. I just want to make sure if you got the rest. Yeah, did you have the one that says, I'm not moving, so stay here? Or did I not write that? It's okay. I might have missed it. I'm sorry. Um, but when you go through text, do you ever find yourself looking at how many times something's said? Listen, those are things that you want to be attentive to. There we go. I'm not moving, so stay here. That's important. I really want, I feel like that's something to grab. Jesus isn't moving. He's not going anywhere. What's the tension? Well, Jesus is always moving. He's alive. He's active. He's everything. Well, that's the point. He's everything, and he's everywhere. He's immense. He's already in everything. So if you would establish yourself the way he's established you in Christ and remain there, seated in heavenly places, then you're set. Don't try to remove yourself from that place. Eight times he says this, and if you include verses 9 and 10, remain is repeated 11 times. To help me, I, I like to try and define things. So I wrote my own definition of the word remain. I wrote to not remove yourself from a place or position acquired or given upon an opportunity to do so. Simply, don't move after you get to a place. Simple. Here's what the Greek word means. The Greek word means this. It means not to depart or continue to be present or to be held. It means to be held, like I'm holding this podium right now. Jesus is saying it's simple. If you'd let me hold to you, keep you where I've placed you by my spirit, and you choose to not move yourself, I guarantee you, you'll have everything I promised you'd have. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate in this text is that Jesus speaks to people who actually process language differently. Some of us are motivated by negative statements. Some of us are motivated by positive statements. And you'll see what I mean. Because <laughs> there's triggers in us. So he does this. Uh, in verse 4, he says, he says this. He says, remain in me, I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. 
neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. That's a negative statement. You can't bear fruit unless you remain in me. Okay. I want to remain in you then. Because I want to bear fruit. What's fruit? We'll get there. But then he also does this in verse 5. If a person remains in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit. Positive statement. How many of you guys are excited about that? How many of you guys are excited about the negative statement? It's okay. Both are okay. Because when I came to the Lord, it was actually mostly the commands that were telling me what I was missing. And that if I didn't do something, I would miss out on my father's presence. That motivated me. It was, if you don't obey my commands, then you don't love me. Oh my gosh. God, I want to know your commands. That was actually real in my spirit. But some of us, we, we receive a different type of language. So the positive statement, if a person remains in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit. But again, verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't want to do nothing. Whoever's motivated by negative statements. It's like, I, I was thinking about this text, and it's kind of funny, I think. It's, it's like this, it's back and forth. He's trying to be sure that we really get this. It's like, so Jesus, <clears throat> if, I re- if I actually receive your love and I take your free gift of my life being saved in exchange, so in exchange, I'm giving you my dirty rags that are temporal and they're like really messed up and gross and they're fading away and they're all going to die and perish anyway. If I give those to you, in exchange for your eternal glory living in me and I let you love people through me and I just simply stay with you, remaining in you, clinging to you, holding to you, loving you, Jesus, and letting you love me, then you're saying I'm going to bear fruit. Yes, that's right. I don't like that. He's like, well, let me say it. He's like, let me say it differently. If you don't do that, then you won't bear any fruit. Hmm. That makes more sense, Jesus. Okay, so it's just this back and forth. Jesus is going back and forth, trying to convey the message over and over, cyclically, negative statements to positive statements, making sure that we get the full breadth, because it's hard for me to understand sometimes. Listen, if you don't remain, you won't produce fruit. If you remain, you'll produce fruit. Yes, God, I want to produce fruit. Jesus is giving us a promise of his eternal glory changed for our our rags and my rags, if we'd simply remain and abide in him. Verse six, if anyone does not remain in me, he says, they are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Now, if I had an orange tree in my yard, I don't have an orange tree, so don't come over to find an orange tree. But if I had one in my yard, because my wife and I loved orange trees, the purpose of us getting the orange tree was for it to produce fruit. But at some point, it, w- it stopped producing fruit, and you know, half of it was maybe getting a, a fruit here or there, and the other half was literally just like dying. And the sticks off of the tree, because they were no, there's no life coming through it, those branches were just dead on the ground. For one, it's not a healthy orange tree. That's kind of bad news. But, but for two, I would ensure that I wouldn't just take those sticks, pick them back up, and try and tape them back into the tree. Because it's not going to work. This is a broken and dead stick that's fallen from a tree. And there's, there's actually no way, it's already dead, there's no way for me to re- reinsert that into it. So what do you do with your dead sticks? You throw them away. It's pretty simple. He's saying, you just take a dead stick and you throw it into the trash can. And eventually, you know, if you want to do something, you could even, you could even burn it. I'm going to hold this for a minute. I want you guys to hear this, family. If you think Jesus is saying that the branch, this actually ministered to me, that the branch which isn't producing fruit, though it is a fruit tree, will be thrown in the fire. If you think that's mean, you're like, Jesus, that's mean. You're going to throw branches that aren't producing into fire? Listen, I want you to do yourself a favor at the next summer bonfire you go to. When someone else collects the sticks and throws them into the fire, I want you to say, that's mean. That's not mean. A stick that doesn't produce gets burned. He's not saying here, listen, I want you guys to hear this. Jesus is not saying that if you're not producing fruit, there's two tensions here. 
that he's just throwing you away. But I want you to take a look at this. Verse 2, God is the one who is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And this is what I believe the text is saying. While every branch that is bearing fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now that can make us uncertain. Well, then how do I know that I'm a branch bearing fruit? I would go just a little bit forward, and I would move you up to verse 5 and 6. Verse 6, he's not saying here in verse 6 to clarify if anyone does not produce fruit now. He's saying that if anyone does not remain in me, he's like the branch thrown away and withers. That's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. You understand? He's saying that, listen, if you haven't been able to remain in Jesus and listen to him and learn how to let him love you and are still working with all this energy and effort to get Jesus to tell you things or to read scripture so that you could become the right Christian that you're created to be, you're not created to be the right Christian. You're just created to be his son and his daughter. If you're doing all these things. You could be doing it out of striving. And all the while, you're not just sitting with Jesus and letting him speak truth over you, telling you who you are. Instead, you're still trying to tell God who you are. God, I'm so messed up. God, I'm so this. God, I can't get to the place you want me to be. God, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And that's what I think Jesus is trying to point to. He's trying to say, listen, I've already made this whole thing easy. I've finished the whole work. And now to be a fruit producing branch, all I'm saying is sit with me and let me speak to you. You don't need to do so much of the speaking. God determines who we are. We don't determine who God is. Now, if we get to the point where we're, start, we're circling in that place, so we're frustrated, we don't know who we are, then all of a sudden, yeah, our branches, what is being produced, I think everyone who's in Christ is producing some fruit, okay? Anyone who's been placed into Christ is producing some fruit. I don't know what it all looks like. We go back to Scripture, we say, well, obviously, good tree has good soil, it's going to produce good fruit, we get it. I'm not getting into all that today. What I'm saying is, do you want to know for certain that you're producing fruit that's eternal, that God is doing something amazing in you? Stay with him. Sit with him. Let him love you. Let him speak to you. Take moments of your day and go and thank him in private and quiet places. Take a walk on your lunch so that he can speak to you. Verse 7 says this, Excuse me, I want to make this distinction also before I move on to that. The second point is this, God is the fruit producer and we are the fruit bearers. God is the fruit producer, we are only the fruit bearers. That's part of the shift in our thinking. Sometimes we're frustrated because we're not producing fruit. Well, good, you should be frustrated because you'll never produce fruit. You can only bear fruit. You get it? Because you're simply... And I'm simply this stick branch placed into the vine, which is Christ. What's actually producing the fruit? It's God. He's the root system. Jesus is the vine. Our Father's just clipping things off that aren't producing to help us grow even more. Isn't that awesome? But you don't get to produce the fruit. That's what I love. One of the things I love about God is that he makes it simple. Verse 7 says this, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. In this text, I believe Jesus is actually distinguishing his very presence and nature and his words as two different points. Listen, if you remain in me and, everyone say and, my words remain in you, then what you will ask, then what you ask will come from another world. See, I think a lot of us can be in places where we are we're either in one or the other. I don't think there's an evil here, but what I believe Jesus is showing us is that he wants us to actually be presently with him, actively p- people who just simply love his presence and pursue him. And he also wants us to understand what he's saying. You see, a lot of times we get to a place where we know the word, but we no longer know Jesus' heart. 
A lot of times, if we know the word without knowing the heart of the Father, all we're going to do is produce religion, which isn't what the world is dying for. And it's not what Jesus adopted you into. He didn't adopt you into religion. Though religion, I have no issue with religion. James 127 says, pure religion that God the Father sees as pure and faultless, seeking after the orphans and the widows in their distress, not being polluted by the world. That's pure religion. That sounds like Jesus to me. <clears throat> but listen, if we go into the word, for those of you, we love the word, but we don't know the heart of the Father behind what he's saying. We're going to point to the world and tell them everything they're doing wrong, rather than by revealing how good God is and all that he's already finished for them to be all that he created them to be. Amen? Now, on the other end, if we are people who love the presence, we love Jesus' presence, we love God's presence here. And we're, we're not better or worse. We're just figuring it out. But what I'm saying is that as you seek Jesus, you love his presence, but you never kind of reflect and dig your life into the word, then you're going to be someone who may have a shaky foundation. It goes both ways. Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Why? That's a hefty promise, Jesus. Fine, Jesus, I'm, I'm going to ask for a new house right now. I'm, I'm going to ask for that new, God, I'm going to go for it. Come on. Listen, if we're so wrapped up in eternity and we've received from Jesus and we're, we're, we're understanding what he's thinking about our situations in life, we, we actually see more and more how he views through us. He's, he's sharing his perspective on our positions at our, at our workplaces. He's sharing with us the way he has a vision for your home environment to be completely different than it's been the last five years, which is what you've been asking for. Maybe part of it is that you know, we've been on one way, when one side or the other. I'm not trying to make a simple answer, but what I'm saying is in his presence and with his word, we understand who God is. It's not one or the other. That's where we get the eternal perspective that Jesus so desires to give us. In verse 8, Jesus says this, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Listen, God isn't one to trick people. And, and it's something that I'm close to, and, and we've talked about this here, I think, before, but God doesn't want to trick you. He's not like, listen, if you do this, if you just make it as simple as I'm trying to make it for you, let it be, remain in me. And I'm going to do this fruit thing with you. It'll be cool. Like, you're going to be full of joy, which that text goes on to say later on in John 15. You're going to be full of joy, complete in joy. And he's like, nah, I'm just playing. You got to do all this stuff to you. He's not there to trick you. That's not the type of father that God is. He speaks the truth every time, and he hits his, his point right on the head. He never misses the mark. And that's why we need Holy Spirit to help us understand what he's saying. He's saying is grab hold of the truth of God's limitless goodness, that he's truly good. All he does is good, that he's in good will towards us. He's a happy, glad God. Jesus says it's to his Father's glory that you and I would bear much fruit. Next slide up there. This is really important. See, God wants you to bear fruit. If God desires you to bear fruit, would not a good father make clear how to bear the fruit? He'll make it clear. This is what he says. You can put the next slide up. It says, God wants you to get radical glory. That's the way I wrote it, but I shortened it. God wants you to get radical glory on earth during your lifetime and through your life. Simply stated, God desires glory through your life. What does God's glory mean? Well, it means that through your life presently, God wants to do something so radical with who you were and who you are in ongoing ways so that the world is shocked by how peaceful, how loving, how kind, how merciful, how gentle, how compassionate, how visionary, how dreamer, how, all, how this whole thing, how are you like that? What's God's glory? God's glory is a people now literally representing him on the earth who sound like him, who look like him, they even smell like him. Scripture says we are the aroma of Christ. Come on. You want to go to some place that smells bad, you're weird. That's gross. 
I like Subway, but you go into Subway and you smell like Subway. What's the aroma of Christ? It's you now into the earth. That's the glory of God now presently. We're not waiting, Christian, for some some end point where God's going to ultimately be glorified. Jesus is returning. This is true. But what we ought not miss is that now is the day that God wants to get massive glory through your life. Where people would go, why do you care so much about me? I told you that I hate you. Why do you keep loving me? Why are you still so kind to me? I'm serious. You're annoying me. Like, dude, I just love you. You know? Or listen, I just, Jesus taught me about being neighbors. That's it. I, we're just trying to be present with you. And you know, sorry we keep asking you if there's anything we can pray for you or about or. Sorry we keep dropping off, you know, a note of encouragement, or whatever it is. And in private, there's things that happen in our lives too. It's not about public things. It's about a private life with God, remaining in Jesus. It's to our Father's glory that you'd bear fruit. It's in God getting his own glory, thus desiring you to be a glory factory on earth that compels us to trust him with, with his pruning. But if I don't remain in him, the pruning that he wants to do cannot be finished. Listen to this. A branch has to be in the vine in order for it to be pruned. God says this in, in, in uh, Jesus says this in verse 1 of chapter 15. He says that God is the gardener. God prunes branches that are growing out of Christ. Branches that are growing out of Christ are always going to get pruned. I've said it before that as a family of believers, as Christians, we can grow up into an older body and be 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, and yet still be a little child in ways that God didn't desire for us to be. One of the things that God has been sharing with me is that because we avoid pruning, guess what? We can't get pruned. Does that say that you don't have fruit being born in your life? No, you're still producing some fruit. But it says that every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. God wants to prune you. That's how you're going to bear more fruit. If today you're satisfied with the amount of fruit, like all the great things God's doing in your life, awesome. You can be content there. That's, I don't think that's evil. But what I believe is that Jesus always says there's more. And we get to be people who ask him for it and seek him for it. That's your part, and that's my part. But if God just overwhelmed you with like, and we get overwhelmed by God's love because it's, it's radical and it's pure. But think if, think if in one moment, God literally went, I'm, these weird sounds coming out of my mouth today. But he just dumped all of this goodness that he, that he's, oh, he sees your life and he's planned and destined you to get all these, have all these really awesome things, and these encounters, all the encounters that you'd ever have with God, all the all the love that you'd ever receive from heaven. You know, if you've ever had a moment or a time in worship or in quiet with Jesus and you're just messed, you're crying, like, God, this is so awesome. Or all the, or all the, um, all the times of prayer and groaning and grieving over a loved one that you're wanting to see healthy and whole or a situation in your life that God is going to answer. But imagine if God dumped all the answers and provision at one time in your life guess what? You wouldn't have a clue what to do with it. You wouldn't have a clue. So what does he say? Listen, I've got great things for you. Keep seeking me. Bethany was singing that song. So perfect. So beautiful. Keep seeking to me. Se seeking me. Stay with me. And I'm going to produce fruit in you. Because I'm going to prune you as you stay with me. If you don't leave where I've asked you to stay, I'll be able to clip those pieces of you that aren't producing any fruit to allow space for more fruit. That's this journey. That's, it's called sanctification. It's becoming the fullness of Christ here on the earth. So we certainly couldn't handle everything that God has for us if he dumped, us, dumped it on us at once, but we could remove ourselves from receiving some of what he has for us, what he desires. I believe that. So my question to you today is, will you remain in him? Not will you be more fruitful, but will you remain in him? 
the practice and grace of remaining. A few things that I just want to leave you with. Questions that I'm going to really push for you to ask this week as, as you kind of consider what does it look like for you to remain? And this is about what remaining is. How do you enjoy God? How do you enjoy God? Is it through worship? Is it through Bible study? Is it through times of prayer? Is it fasting? Is it going on a walk outside? Is it sharing stories with a friend or a loved one? How do you enjoy God? Is it called spiritual pathways? And I'll ask you this, when was the last time you did that? Because I know what my life looks like, but I don't know what your life looks like. So my charge for you is to get the best life God has for you. And that means ask God, God, when was the last time I really, really enjoyed you? And I just got, I was so satisfied to be with you. When was the last time? And what was I doing? Hmm. We have spiritual pathways. That would be something to ask yourself in how to remain. The second thing is this, and I have three things. So ask yourself, how do you enjoy God? My challenge is go do that again, and then go do it some more for the next week. Just do it some more for a week. Second thing is this, in those times, focus on thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in our spirits is the access to God's provision for truth. Because frustration mounts when, again, we focus on situations that God already has an answer for, but we're so intent on the answer being something technical or outside of God's presence, we miss out on the truth of Jesus living in us right now. And so we say, God, I want to see that answer. I don't know what's going on. And da, 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 da. And instead, he's like, thank you, God, that you have the answer. Let your mind, take it, make a choice to shift your mind. Say, God, I actually thank you. You have an answer. You have an answer for my mom who's sick. Thank you, Jesus, that you have an answer for, for how I can actually love this person that I've had a hard time loving. God, thank you. Thank you so much that in Christ now, I have everything that I need. God, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to get there. I don't know if I even understand all this, but I want to make sure that you know I'm thankful. So I thank you, God. And the third thing is this. I'd encourage you to do this. Write down places in your life you believe God is saying you haven't been obedient. Is that okay? You got all serious. Okay. Well, here, here's what I want you to know that in the next text, we're not getting into it today, but Jesus goes on to say this. He says, as a father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Who wants to stay and remain in the love of God? I want to remain in the love of God. I don't want anything to take me from that place. Jesus then says, listen, I'm not asking you to do something I haven't done, but he says, just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love, so I'm asking you. What has Jesus actually asked you to do? Grace is awesome. Grace is awesome. We get to live in it every day. But some of you are sitting on things that God has already spoken to you about, and you haven't done anything. You're like, why am I so, uh, why am I so, uh, this is so, fr- uh, so hard. You want another, you want to have another word. Listen, I, if I want another word from God and I know that I'm still sitting on three things that God has already said clearly for me to do and I haven't done them, he doesn't want me to get crazy with the disobedience, so he won't give me some new things. Son, I want you to just take care of those three things that I've already asked you to do. Is that Okay. So this week, make a list. Practice obedience. Do it by faith. Risk obeying God no matter the cost. You can write that down. Risk obeying God no matter what the cost. And in remaining, I know this is this kind of ethereal thing, um, but it is, it's, hard to, it's hard to really unpack for one day. But just knowing that remaining is staying with Jesus. I think of remaining as how did you get there in the first place? If Jesus says remain in me, then how did you get in him? And what was that like? You do some reflecting. It was simple. You didn't work for it. God put you there. God overwhelmed you with love, a lot of you, one day. And then over time, some of us get bored or tired. And we get weary of good things. Well, then forget the good things and just remember the good king. Remain in my love. Stay there. In remaining, all fruit is produced. Simple. 
You're saying, all I have to do is remain in Jesus' love, listen to what his heart, what his voice and his voice is saying, and dive in. That's what he's saying. I believe that. If we want to be a person who's truly living our identity given from heaven through Jesus, understanding the principle and truth of remaining is most vital. We no longer have a lesser understanding of dying than going to heaven, but now being in Christ and living, bringing heaven to earth today. Christ didn't give his life to get you to heaven, but to bring heaven into you. Again, we want to see things change, but listen, Jesus is saying, I want to change you and for you to go deeper. That's the catalyst for all the answers that he has waiting for the city, for your family, for the neighborhood, for this church, our identities and remaining. Remaining can look like this in practical, practical ways. When someone cuts you off on the freeway, you used to have this thing that you did. It wasn't a wave, but it was kind of mean. Um, you're kind of angry. And, uh, and that was something that you just did because you're just mad. You needed everyone to respect you and cutting you off on the freeway. You don't respect me. I'm going to tell you how angry I am. Listen, remaining for you today is actually going, wow. Someone cuts you off. Father, oh, I thank you for that person, God. I ask that you keep him safe. Jesus, I don't know what's happening. Lord, I just ask that you keep him safe. Wow, God, I'm aware right now. I want to be mad. Something in me wants to be mad right now, but I'm not mad at them. They didn't do anything to me. <laughs> they didn't change my reality. They didn't change my eternity. I'm full of love right now, God. And so remain, remaining in Jesus is like that. It's like this. It's when a coworker is speaking lies about you, when someone in your life is gossiping about you, and the old nature, that one that was in Adam, that was dead in sin and transgressions, used to spit back fire. Why? Because you didn't know who you were. You didn't know how good the love of the Father was for you. And then you met Jesus, and it transformed you. And so when it happens now again, you're tempted to go back to an old way of responding, but you remain in Jesus. Jesus, what would you say to this person, God? That, I'm kind of hurt, actually. I used to be mad. Why am I hurting? God, why am I hurting? Why am I hurting? They're talking about me. Oh my gosh, Lord, I'm broken for them. Why do they keep needing to talk about me? God, what, what's happening in their life? Father, show me how to pray for them. I don't have a clue what's happening in their life. God, they're amazing. God, I thank you. They've got a purpose in you. They were created for light, and I believe the enemy's trying to take that light from them. That's remaining in Jesus. The neighbor's doing some uncertain business, and you love them still. We have a friend. I'm wrapping up with this story. <clears throat> We have a friend who's uh, nearby, and uh, lately I've, I've talked about some of the, the drug busts that have been happening. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this in Elmira, but I think in the last month or so, 11 people have overdosed from different various drugs. And, uh, and just recently, a week, week and a half ago, there was a pretty significant drug bust networking different people in different areas. It included a couple few houses in Elmira into Pennsylvania, <clears throat> and uh, one of them was uh, a neighbor to a friends of ours, friends of mine and Mickey's. And, um, and our friend, she had said that for a while, she knew there was something uncertain happening there. By uncertain, I mean something probably illegal. And uh, she was praying about what to do about it. Now, uh, this is just a dear friend of ours, middle age, who's learning how to remain and live in the love of Jesus for people. She was anxious about it. She was a little bit afraid, but she kept praying and seeking God's answer. God, how do I just stay with you in this? Because I don't know what to do. And she kept praying and asking and asking. And uh, lo and behold, finally one day after some various interactions, she ends up <clears throat> getting to talk to this, this gentleman, this man, who she knew was involved in some, some shady business. And, uh, and here's what our friend does. She ends up talking to him, getting some of his, you know, what's going on, and, and uh, start talking about Jesus somehow. And she ends up, knowing he's involved in illegal stuff, she ends up saying this, can I pray for you? He says, yeah, that's fine. Let's her pray for him. And she says this, she prays this, God, she could throw venom on him. God, thank you that you've made him to be a leader. You've called him to be a leader, God. And I bless him with this gift, God. Jesus, thank you for teaching him how to lead. Thank you for showing him where to lead. Is he a leader? Yep. Who's taken what God gave him and has perverted it and twisted it? The enemy. Remaining in Christ looks like that. Speaking the truth over someone's identity and destiny 
not pouring out. You see, people all around us, I see people, listen, drug dealers, those who are addicted, all these things, each one of them, each one of them is looking. They don't know who they are. Well, guess what? I get to be a part of them knowing who they are. This gentleman was actually arrested a short while later, about a week later, I think, in this drug bust. And uh, he has some federal charges against him. But you know what I know? Is that he was prophesied over a week before he went into this, this situation. Someone was willing to risk, risk faithfulness and remaining in Jesus' heart towards a person that, listen, old ways, old me, that would have made me mad. Listen, I see someone in the neighborhood, this is tough stuff. It's not easy because there's a multitude of effects that happen when we're in a community and evil is happening. But staying in Jesus, he's got the perspective that will actually shake people's current life and thrust them into their eternal destiny. Remain in him. Don't worry about the fruit. God will take care of the fruit. Remain in Jesus. Keep seeking, keep asking. The alternative is to not remain not remaining. Not remaining is having no picture, no destiny, no vision for people's lives when they're messed up. I'm going to ask that you guys would stand with me.